Awesome. So yes, last one of the workshop. So very exciting. Uh, hopefully everyone's still able to pay attention and uh, <laughs> is around. Um, so yes, of course, this is a Creative Commons uh, lecture. So yeah, just going through that quickly. And then our final topic of the day and of the course is emerging pathogen, pathogen detection and identification. Uh, so normally my coworker Aaron Petkow does this module. Uh, he couldn't join this time around, so I'm taking his place. Uh, my name is Darian Hole. I'm a uh, bioinformatician at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So for this lecture, we're going to do our learning objectives. So by the end, you should learn the processes and techniques used to detect and monitor existing infectious diseases. Understand metagenomic sequencing and the use of Kraken and Kraken2 for data analysis, and learn how to identify a new pathogen using metagenomic sequencing data. Uh, so to start, what are novel and emerging pathogen infectious diseases? So I found a couple definitions on this when I was just trying to play around and see the best way to describe it, and I've settled on these for the moment. So an emerging infectious disease are ones that have not occurred in human hosts previously, so those are novel or are quickly growing in the total number of cases or the total number of areas where people are sick. So cases are either increasing very quickly or the number of areas geographically is increasing very quickly. And this is in slight contrast to re-emerging diseases, which are ones that have come back after a major decline. Um, so this could be due to a variety of reasons, including problems in public health interventions. So lack of vaccination um, or a new strain or resistances have been gained by the disease. So a good example of that would be TB. Um, so as I said, these are definitions are a bit, little iffy sometimes from everything I've looked around. Um, they're both labels in the end, and they both are used together most of the time. Um, they're describing diseases which are growing in total case numbers based on a, either new fitness, so again, mutations or resistances, or being introduced to a greater, more immunonaive audience. Uh, so some quick examples would be the initial SARS outbreak in 2002. So that one spread quickly from China on aircraft around the world. Uh, that one only lasted a year, so that wasn't too long, thankfully, but that was the initial one. Um, another good example of an emerging disease would be COVID, the current one. It's still somewhat going on. Um, and then a third one that I found labeled as emerging and as re-emerging, depending on the paper, is Zika virus. So we had, I think Finn talked about Zika very quickly yesterday, um, but for Zika, it was first discovered, or first, yeah, first reported in Uganda in the 1940s and 50s, and then this outbreak happened in 2014 and 2015, where it was introduced to the American, or the North American and South American populations. So again, diseases that have either emerged, um, to new populations or re-emerging due to some sin going on. Uh, so now factors involved in the spread and emergences of these diseases. Uh, so as we know, diseases have always followed the movement of humans throughout history. Uh, so us and our livestock, and also the things we don't really want following us, they always stay with us, like mosquitoes and rats. Um, historically, this is through warfare, trade, and very restricted travel. So in our little figure here, if you were in the 1933 and you wanted to go from England to Brazil, it would take a bit of time, but you could still do it. Um, and then the uh, a good example of this, I guess, would be the repeated yellow fever epidemics that happened in the 18th and 19th century on the east coast of the US. And that was from yellow fever being imported. So it still happened in the past. It's just not as frequently. It was uh, more isolated in events. Um, so more recently, as you can see by our more recent flight charts, uh, we're very well connected. So it's very easy for something to spread from one place to another. Other factors, climate change. So climate change isn't impacting the diseases or the organisms themselves, the vectors that transmit them, and the wildlife. So there's three different things involved with climate change. Um, so for vectors, expanding vector ranges lead to diseases that were once more centralized to certain locations being uh, like spreading out. Um, so an example again is Zika. Uh, so my figure here is from this one paper, and it's just showing the change in months of transmissibil transmission suitability, sorry, 
from now until 2050. So this is a prediction. So for this prediction, we're showing that it's not a huge change in transition suitability, but there's about one to two months more for most of the world for the highlighted areas in the transition to Zika virus. Um, this isn't every virus or every vector though. So malaria is another example of one that's gonna be affected by or predicts to be, to be affected by climate change. And malaria is actually shifting target or shifting locations instead of just expanding. So for malaria, it seems to be moving further north and south from its initial uh, range. And then the other one with this again is wildlife. So as wildlife moves with the climates, you have more interactions between people that weren't there before potentially, and that can lead to zoonotic events and the spread and creation of new diseases. And then finally is urbanization. So Urbanization is the movement of people to more urban areas. Uh, urbanization increases population density, so diseases can more easily spread there. And uh, it also impacts some of the quality of the environment around it. So urbanization can increase air pollution, leading to lung problems potentially, and that makes people more susceptible to, disease, to diseases. Uh, it also, again, leads to changes in the interaction of people and animals, whether that be vectors like mosquitoes and rats that thrive in urban settings or are take, both taking over of natural environments and causing the novel human interactions or novel human wildlife interactions again. Um, the other thing with urbanization could be the displacement of farms where as we take over more land, farms shift and that also leads to potential novel interactions with wildlife and livestock that can create zoonotic events. So now, what are our goals in infectious disease surveillance? They're to describe the current burden and epidemiology of disease. So epidemiology being the quantification of disease occurrence within a specific population. Uh, and these can be things such as AMR levels or genotypes, what's circulating, anything like that. Uh, number two is to monitor disease trends. So that could be the impact of interventions that we're trying to do on the whole population. And look at controlling, eradicating, and eliminating any potential diseases. And then finally, for surveillance, we want to try and identify outbreaks and new pathogens before they become a big problem. So early identification is very key in stopping the spread of something. Um, so for our figure here, this is just from next strain. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 lineages from the start of the pandemic till now. And this is a good example of infectious disease surveillance where we're tracking the genotypes of the virus or the lineages. And you can kind of see how that's changed over time. Uh, so we can break infectious disease surveillance down into a couple of different methods. I'm just going to focus on this one. Uh, so for surveillance, we can break it into disease specific, which is very self-explanatory, the disease itself. Uh, syndromic, which is analysis, interpretation, and collection of health-related data. And this can give us some good early identifications of potential pathogens happening or circulating in the population. And then event-based surveillance, which would be unstructured information from text sources, such as journal articles. So in this figure, we just have a couple of examples of different types. Um, so again, disease specific is specific to a disease. So that could be AMR resistance profiles, our lab data on subtypes, lineages, or clades. So if you think like COVID, you're a subtype that's circulating. Um, for syndromic, I like the good examples at the bottom here, where you could look at pharmacy sales. So if a drug is increasing in sales, there might be something circulating that that drug helps treat. Um, or other types of data, such as web searches. So if there's an increase of web searches relating to, say, a symptom or a disease itself, and people are curious if they have something, that might be an indicator of something circulating in the population. So they're non-specific. So there's not a specific thing they're pointing to, but they might be underlying, uh, they might show an underlying disease circulating. And the biggest thing about these two is they both involve structured data. So we talked about structured data on the second day, um, which is data that can be organized, formatted, and manipulated more easily. Um, and as you saw then, it's very important that the data is well curated. That way you can easily uh, go and identify stuff that's happening. So if your data is all over the place, it makes it a lot harder to, to analyze it and see that there's something going on. And then I talked about event-based surveillance. So this is a quick example. Um, for 
COVID-19, there was the initial media reports that occurred once the virus was uh, in China in December of 2019. Uh, so these were cases of unknown viral pneumonia. Uh, so that was unstructured data as a report that was tipping people off to there's something that's going on that we might want to look into. And then another good example would be the monkey fox outbreak, outbreak sorry, that happened in 2022. So for this one, there was a government health notice from the UK uh, about confirmed cases. And so that was, again, event-based surveillance. Something's happened, it's been reported, and it's events we can see. And the biggest thing with these is they're unstructured. So it's a bit harder to use them automatically, but it's good to pull the information from them. Uh, so the biggest thing with these ones is that you want to further investigate to confirm, identify, and characterize the cause of the disease. So again, for SARS-CoV-2, they sequenced the genome. They actually didn't sequence the genome uh, after it was reported. So now we're going to focus on our disease-specific surveillance, and we're going to focus on different laboratory methods in pathogen surveillance. So again, we're looking at specific pathogens, and then we'll move on to to trying to find novel infectious diseases. Uh, so it's going to be broken up mostly into the source of your sample. So the first one will be clinical. So people who are sick, you get a sample from them, or you can just have samples from the general populace. If there's people in the hospital for other reasons, just check. Those samples, you can do diagnostic tests or cultures. You can end up with whatever you do for whatever you find uh, and create reports. Or if they are sick with a bacterium, you can do different tests to determine what type of antivirus they're susceptible to. So that would be clinical. Another example that I think Ed touched on a bit in his was foodborne. Uh, so foodborne surveillance. So foodborne surveillance has been around for a while. We had PulseNet Canada established, I believe, in the early 2000s, with the US establishing theirs a little bit earlier. Um, so it's been around for a while. And they originally did more laboratory-based techniques and then moved to the more genomic ones. Um, but basically, the only real difference here is you're taking your sample from food and then using your lab methods to determine what's in it, if there's anything bad, and then reporting that back to the public or to the specific government organization it needs to go to. And the third one would be environmental uh, surveillance. So SARS-CoV-2 is a good one for this. There's been environmental wastewater surveillance, surveillance for that for a little while now. Um, but historically, another good example would be be polio virus, where they were doing rudimentary surveillance back in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, so again, same thing for this one. We're trying to see what's in the sample. Um, so we're looking for specific things. We're trying to quantify if it's there, detect if it's there, and then base, produce reports based on that. So I want to go a bit more into detail on some of these environmental surveillance ones with just some quick examples. So I briefly mentioned COVID there. Uh, so this is the government COVID-19 uh, what do you call it? surveillance dashboard. Um, I just picked Winnipeg because that's where I live. Um, and it tells you if there's COVID in that site. So you can see there is COVID at all of the sites still, unfortunately. Um, but you can also see the level. So you can determine how much is there based on your testing. So for Winnipeg North that I've had highlighted, it's low. Whereas for Winnipeg South, it's still high. And with that, you can inform or determine what type of interventions you want to do with your population. Uh, and then the other thing with the COVID surveillance uh, is that because COVID is circulating in such a, a large amount, um, you can also, and even if it wasn't, you could do detection and I, or sorry, not detection, you could do genotyping with this. So as Jared talked about in his lecture, um, when you're looking at mixed samples, which this would be because it's wastewater with a bunch of different lineages, there can be a bit of, it's very hard to determine exactly what is there, but you can get an idea of what's there. Um, so for COVID, as an example, again, we have our variants that are circulating in the water. So this is still wastewater data. And we use a program called Freya, which is from the Anderson lab who wrote IVAR, which you also all used back in the viral uh, modules workshop. And it just determines or tries to determine the abundance of different lineages in your SARS CoV 2 samples from your sequencing data sets. So, an example of how you could do look at exactly what's in the water for your population based on wastewater surveillance. And I put a second example. I talked about polio. So, we did have a polio detection in Canada back in 2022 in December. And same thing, we determined it was there. We determined there wasn't very much there. 
And we also got a genotype of it. So for that one, it was vaccine-derived poliovirus 2 that was in the wastewater samples in Montreal. So you can see how these type of surveillance techniques are very important in determining what's circulating in your population. Find something early and see if you need to do any interventions. And the biggest thing with all three of them, as I've been talking about the whole time here, is that they all require laboratory-based testing techniques that are specific to your pathogen of interest. So when you're doing your wastewater surveillance, you, it's very hard, or would be very hard, to implement a method to do it on everything, every pathogen ever. Um, so these are very focused in what they're looking at. And so now we're going to look at some lab-based methods, sorry, lab-based methods for pathogen detection. Um, so these include serotyping, culturing, proteomics, microscopy, and nucleic acid amplification steps. Um, some of these have been talked about previously as well, so we'll just kind of briefly touch on them and then keep going. So very uh, common one, or one that's not super hard to do, is serotyping. So we're looking for molecules on the cell surface called antigens, and we're using antibodies to try and create an agglutination of these. So if you have your action of interest, your antibody will bind to it, and then once they bind, all bind together, you get a clump that comes out of solution, and you get a positive result based on that. So this would be a good absence or presence or absence test for something. And again, you're specifically looking for a specific antigen, so very specific. The other one, or another one, would be uh, restriction digest based methods. So, we don't want to talk about this too much, um, but basically, cutting with a restriction enzyme to, or which cuts at specific sites to create a fragment pattern, which you can run on a gel and then determine if there's differences in your samples. Um, yeah, we don't want to talk about that too much, but that's an example. And then another one would be our nucleic acid application based techniques, so PCR. Um, where we're looking for specific genetic signatures in their genome. Um, and again, you want to be specific with these because if we're looking for presence or absence of something, having a primer that binds to a lot of things is not super helpful because you get lots of off-target false positives. Um, so briefly, I'm pretty sure everyone knows PCR, but just very briefly, if we're looking at real-time quantitative PCR, um, you do your RNA extraction, reverse transcribe the cDNA. And then, as I said, your specificity is based on your primer sequence. So that binds to your, your cDNA fragments. And then you amplify that. And if you have the presence of the sample, you'll get a positive result. And obviously, if you have no presence, it's negative. Presence or absence can be quantified based on when you cross that threshold of detection, which is your CT, so your cycle threshold. Uh, the earlier you cross that, the more nucleic acid you started with. So that can be how you quantify your, your sample. And then finally, the last one we're going to quickly talk about is multi liquid sequence typing. So again, Ed talked about this in his lecture, and I won't spend too much time on it. Um, the classical one here being that we're investigating these seven loci or a small amount of loci. They get assigned an identifier based on their allele. And then this combination of identifiers gets a unique sequence type. And this is expanded upon into your core genome MLST schemes and your whole genome MLST schemes. So quick reminder, core genome, it's in all of your genomes, or almost all of them, hopefully all of them though. Um, something like a housekeeping gene would be a good example. And then your whole genome would be your core genome plus your accessory proteins. And this gives a more detailed classification system to subtype your organism uh, much more so than the other MLST or the basic MLST scheme. Uh, so now from there, we're going to look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of these traditional methods and then go into some metagenomics. So what are the advantages of traditional pathogen detection? Well, you're looking for something specific. So if it's there, you'll very likely detect it, which is very good. Uh, and it allows us to better resolve a signal from the loss. So if you have a bit of a bit of a noisy sample or, or a not super high quality sample, this the specificity of these methods can help you determine if you actually have something there or not. Um, you can also use it to subtype pathogens that we've shown with some of the schemes before, or yeah, some of the schemes before. And those are reasons why they're still very well, they're still very good and well used today. Now, some of the disadvantages of these methods are that they're very rigid. 
So if you have something that doesn't quite fit into your existing classification system, it can be hard to get it to work, right? You might not detect this. Uh, same thing if something is novel. So if something's completely new, you'll completely miss it with any of these methods um, or very likely miss it with them. And then another disadvantage with this rigidity is if your pathogen has evolved, uh, it may not be detected either. So a good example for that, which is in integrated assignment two, as an example, was the 6970s spike deletion in the alpha variants of SARS-CoV-2. And with this one, there was a PCR primer dropout in the spike region because that deletion is right where the primer binds. Um, so that's part of where something can change and then you no longer detect it. And that can be a disadvantage of this method or these methods. Oops, scrolled way too far. Uh, and the other thing is that you require a lot of knowledge on your pathogen of interest to do specific or and traditional methods. Uh, so for PCR, so you need to know kind of the genome sequence of the pathogen to determine or to create those primers to bind to it and detect it. Um, and you also, if you have an unknown sample, you need to know or have an idea of what it's causing it to be able to look for something. So if you're just blindly guessing, you might be wasting money or spending a lot of time and trying the traditional methods when it might be a lot faster to just go and do shotgun sequencing, which is what we're going to look at next. And spend most of our time on this shotgun sequencing analysis. So what is shotgun metagenomic sequencing for novel and emerging pathogen detection? So shotgun metagenomics um, is a genome sequencing technique that provides an unbiased survey of nucleic acid content. So this nucleic acid can be DNA or RNA. And when I say unbiased, we're looking at something that isn't isolating or culturing a specific pathogen or organism. So you're just taking your sample and analyzing it or prepping it for library prepping it basically and sequencing that. Um, so on my figure here, it's just a very quick rundown of how something like this would happen or how you do something like this, just the lab side setup. Very, very simple. Uh, there's a lot more steps involved in the lab, but we're not going to touch on those. Uh, so basically, you have your total nucleic acid extraction of the sample, which can contain RNA viruses, bacteria, fungi, DNA viruses, parasites, and your host DNA, so your human DNA. Um, if you're taking an environmental sample, it might have other things as well. So you might have random DNA in there that you don't expect. Uh, and from there, you can take your RNA and go to cDNA, so reverse, trans reverse transcribe, or just take your DNA and RNA and completely sequence that. Uh, so yeah, again, we're just sequencing everything in the sample, unbiased, no filtering. Just everything goes in, and then we analyze that. So a quick comparison of our culture-dependent genomics methods to our metagenomics. And this is just from the link paper down below by Anne and Nicole. Um, basically, they start at the same point. You're doing your biological sample collection. And from there, if you're doing culture-dependent methods, so you're doing isolate gen genomics, you're going to culture to microbial pure, cult that's right, microbial pure culture, um, and then extract the DNA. So once you do that, you'll have the pure DNA from whatever's grown. So it's very, should be very good, hopefully. Um, whereas if you're doing a culture-independent method or a metagenomic method, you'll have a complex community of microbes. And when you extract that DNA, that complex DNA stays with you. So there's a lot of things that are potentially in your sample. And one of the better things about metagenomics is that if you can't culture something, it'll be here still, hopefully. So it can get that that side of things that culture misses because some things require very complex communities to be cultured. And with this, you would get a wide variety of fragments. Uh, so again, if we keep looking, like I said, we get our, for our left, we have our nice solution now, Jomus here. We have our pure one organism fragments from a pure culture. We sequence that and we get reads just from that. That can hopefully give us a really high quality gene because there's only one thing there. On the metagenomic side, we get a bunch of stuff. So it reads from a bunch of different organisms. They get sequenced. And then you just have a read file with whatever, basically, anything that was in that sample. Uh, so that can make it hard to analyze. Um, but you have a lot of stuff. So we have to go through how we will do that. 
So another quick comparison before we start looking at our raw read data um, is the time it takes to do them. So if you're culturing something, it can take a long time. This is just from another paper. Uh, so if you're culturing something, it can take anywhere from 24 hours to weeks. So I think TV takes four weeks to culture, but I don't remember it fully. Um, so something like that can take a long time to do. Whereas if you're doing metagenomic sequencing, it can take under 24 hours potentially. And now while this image shows something like nanopore sequencing going for seven hours, you probably want to keep it going for longer than that. Uh, making sure you have high quality data if you're using it to determine if someone is sick with something. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing from here that I want to say is that it takes a lot less time to do metagenomic sequencing of something if you're trying to identify the cause of the disease. Uh, so now some really important things for metagenomic sequencing, especially from patient samples, would be post-reduction. So depending on where you take your sample, uh, depends, determines how much host is there. So for fecal samples, you can have under 5% human DNA or host DNA in your samples. Whereas for cerebral spinal fluid, that can be anywhere, or they can be over 99%. You can have almost all host DNA there. Uh, normally that's supposed to be uh, free from anything. So this is important because a lot of host DNA can make it take longer to analyze your data. And if you want to submit your data, I think we talked about this briefly before, to an external repository, and you don't want to include the human DNA there, just well, for privacy reasons, I shouldn't say yes for that, but for privacy reasons, you don't want to include the human DNA. And while I've seen debates on how much human sequence is okay, we want to limit that to being as little as possible. Um, so yeah, so we have to try and get rid of it, basically, to make easier analyses and allow us to submit our data and better analyses. Uh, so there's two ways to do that. You can either do it through wet lab methods or through computational methods. So for wet lab methods, you're either trying to enrich microbial contents to hopefully lower the amount of host sample or host DNA in your sample, or you're trying to degrade that host DNA without affecting your microbial DNA. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Uh, I just have a list here. So you can do CPG island hybridization, RRNA completion, polyase selection, or selective host cell lysis and DNA degradation. Uh, so on our figure on the right here is just an example of how different wet lab methods work in terms of decreasing the host DNA, along with how they affect other microbes in the sample. So there's human DNA in the left bars, uh, bacterial DNA in the second bar, and then virus DNA in the third. So just based on different methods, you can see that some things degrade human DNA well, but they also degrade your what you want to look at. So you have to be very careful in terms of doing uh, host DNA degradation because you don't want to miss what's in your sample. The other method, as I said, you could utilize are the computational approaches. So these would either be mapping to a host genome and removing reads that do that, which we'll do in our lab right after this. Or you can use taxonomic read classification system and remove reads based on that. So we also do this. Um, but not in the lab for moving reads, we'll do it to classify our organism. And we'll touch more on the taxonomic reading classification in a second. Uh, next up, the other big thing with metagenomic samples is contamination. So because we're taking whatever we can find from our, our sample, we want to be very certain that there's nothing contaminated. Uh, so negative controls are vital to identify contamination in your sample. You don't want to think that something is a cause of agent of a disease when it's been a contamination from an earlier step. Um, so again, these contaminations can occur at any stage from collection, extraction, and preparation to human error in setting up your experiments, uh, lab reagents, lab equipment, coats. So being very careful when doing metagenomic sequencing and setting up metagenomic experiments uh, is very important just because, again, you don't know what's in your sample to start most of the time, and you want to make sure that nothing you see in it is from contamination. So now we have the reads that hopefully have no contamination and have no host DNA. Uh, what do we do with those? So we're here. What do we do next? Uh, so we can do a couple of things. As I alluded to earlier, you can take your reads and just straight up try and use 
uh, program to identify what they are or assign them to a tax limit rank. So that'd be one thing you could do. Uh, the second thing you could do is try and do a metagenomic assembly. So you could try and create quantigs from your reads with a metagenomic assembler. Uh, these can then be either assigned to a taxonom or taxonomic rank as well, or you can try and bid them, bin them into species based on certain characteristics. Uh, the biggest thing with metagenomic analyses is that the interpretation of the data can be quite tricky. So being always aware of what's going on is important. So we're gonna go into a bit more detail on some of our metagenomic assembly and bidding steps. So for metagenomic assembly, again, again, there's a couple different assemblers you can use. Um, so MegaHit is one we're gonna use in the lab. You can also use MetaSpades and a couple others. These are De Bruyne graph assemblers where they break your reads into fragments of size K called the Kamer, and they construct graphs from those Kamers to create the context by following the path through the graph. And I think Gary went over that one in one of the first lectures. So metagenomic assembly follows similar methods to Genoco assembly. Um, and with that, you will get your assembled contigs. And with the assembled contigs, you can try and bin those, again, based on shared characteristics, such as our tetranucleotide frequencies, our abundances for our codon usage, to get different species from them or different identifiers. And those can be used to do other things, such as gene prediction, gene annotation, phylogenies, and so on. So when we do our binning, we call that a metagenome assembled genome. So a bit of wordy, uh, bit of a wordy label, but it's a mag. So you get a metagenome assembled genome, which is a mag. And again, these can be used for a bunch of different things downstream. So now that we've kind of gotten a simple idea of what we can do with our metagenomic sequencing, so we can either figure out what's in our sample straight from the reads or try and do some assembly and some binning. Uh, how do you do this assignment? So taxonomic assignments is the process of, of assigning reads or contigs to a taxon, and it can occur at any different taxonomic rank you want. So you can assign whatever you're looking at to a phylum, a class, a genus, a species, whatever. Um, it typically performs by comparing your read or your contig to a reference database of known taxa. So just taking your read, you compare it to your database, and then you try and figure out what it is. Uh, so which taxonomic, taxonomic assignment method is best is something that's important to think about. Uh, so our considerations for these tools would be how fast they are, how sensitive they are, and how specific they are. So as an example, I've got a figure from the Cracker 2 paper that just kind of shows the comparison of a couple of different read-based methods for doing taxonomic assignments. Um, and you can see this is just comparing them based on speed and memory usage at the top, and then their sensitivity, their positive predictive value, which is the true positives divided by our true positives and our false positives, and the F1 measure. So again, considerations for our assignment methods it should be fast because we have lots of data sensitive. You want to make sure you see what's in your sample and specific because you don't want to decide on other things. Uh, another example would be STAP from NCBI. So that one is done on all the uh, SRA submissions to their, their database. So we looked at some tools with that paper, or just very quickly. What about using BLAST? Everyone loves BLAST, right? Uh, well, BLAST is a fast sequence alignment program, and it's got a lot of customizable parameters that you can use to fine tune your specificity and sensitivity. Uh, it is not fast enough for our job here. So we potentially have millions of reads, and running them through BLAST would take ages. Um, you could do this with mags, though, and that would be a good idea. But for the reads themselves, this would not work very well. It would take forever. And then you also have the additional challenge of managing that output data. So BLAST will give you something like this, and you got to figure out what to do with this and how to interpret it and use that for your downstream results. So BLAST is good for mags, bad for reads. Um, some more examples of how, why is this one right here. So if you do blast something, how do you choose the correct blast hit for a read? 
Um, and he kind of, yeah, so how do you choose the plus last match for a read? So something like this would give you a bunch of different bacteria. And your scores are from those. So it can be hard to determine if your read, if you're with, sorry, if we're using reads here, is from a common genomic spot, so like a gene that's shared with a bunch of families, or something else. So our question is, where do we assign it? Uh, so you'd have to choose the tech correct taxonomic rank based on what you see. So if we have a read that hits to a bunch of different orthopox viruses like this, we'd probably want to assign it at the taxonomic rank of orthopox virus instead of a species rank. Uh, and again, with blast, you'd have to do this potentially for every read. So that would take forever if you had 10 million reads. So good for mags, bad for reads, your blast for metagenomes. With that, we're going to look at some taxonomic assignment with Kraken instead. So I looked, we briefly looked at that figure before, but Kraken is a fast tool that's very accurate and does metagenom metagenomic, assign sorry, metagenomic assignments with cameras. So no alignments like blasts, we're using our cameras. And we're gonna go through a toy example of how Kraken 2 does this and then go from there. So when we're looking at a read, how do you get a camer? I think we've looked at this before, but we'll just quickly review. So a camer is just a subsequence, a fixed size K of a genomic sequencer read. So we have this read here, and we want to break it into camers of size four, called the former. You would just look at the first four bases, and that'd be your first former, and then move one over, look at the next four bases, and that would be your second former. And you would do that all the way along your read, until you get your set of camers for that read. So this is your group of camers for our one read here. So now if we're building a Kraken database, we have to set up a database of these camers that is specific to our organisms of interest. So what we're putting in the database. Uh, so for our example, we're gonna look at a database where we have owl, uh, turtle, and snake genomes. And with that, these are our, our uh, genomic camers that are associated with these species. So we're assuming these four are associated with owl, these four camers are associated with turtle, and these four are associated with snake. So once we have that set up, we have to determine um, or build our database, sorry. So we assign camers to labels based on our observations. So if we have a camer of AGCG, and its observation is owl, we would assign that camer to an owl. So if we see that camer in our read, we'd say that camer is part of an owl. Uh, if we see something like TTTT in our example, that one would be for a snake. So we'd assign that read to snake. If we had something that was in multiple different observations, so this AG, AG read is in both snake and turtle, it would be assigned to the lowest common ancestor between those two, which would be a reptile. So as it's in both things, it goes up a level because the lowest common ancestor between them is reptile. And then finally, if we do this for more reads, so another example would be vertebrate reads here. If you see this read in everything, the highest or lowest, sorry, taxonomic uh, class we put it in would be vertebrates. So it goes all the way up. So if we've done that for every read in our example data sets, you end up with a database kind of like this, where your camers are here, your observation for what they were is in the middle, and then what you classify them based on that observation is on the right. So again, we've gone through every camer in our database, so our genome or genome of camers, and we've classified them into a taxonomic rank. So how does camera or so how does Kraken handle this data? Kraken uses a sub camer called a minimizer or an Elmer of the data to more efficiently look through our database and determine what things are. Uh, so the idea is that you group collections of similar cameras together and assign them to one identifier in the database to improve a look of efficiency. So this is how Kraken 2 can look through the data so much quicker. 
Uh, and then the reason why Kraken 2 is so much better than Kraken 1 is that it has a couple more steps in kind of compressing that data to make it smaller, so smaller database size. Uh, so Kraken 2 reduces the database by storing compact caches from the minimizers instead of the full thing. So you can see how much smaller Kraken 2 one individual record would be compared to Kraken 1. So please, if you are looking at analyzing it, don't use Kraken 1 anymore unless you're looking at older samples that were recreating older pages. Kraken 2 is a lot quicker and does this uh, a very good job as well. So again, we have our database. Let's try and use it to classify a read that we started with. Uh, these are our papers again, our observations, and that taxonomic classification reports. So here's our read. We want to determine what organism this read was from. So if we start off, or if we do, sorry, assign all of our, our cameras from that read to our tree, we see that we have one assigned to vertebrates, one assigned to owl, one assigned to turtle, and then three assigned to snake. So from there, we ask the question, where did this read originate? From which organism? And based on our data, uh, we look at the root to leaf Root to leaf path with maximal weight is a mouthful. Uh, or, but basically, the most reads from the root to the leaf uh, to determine what our organism is. So, because with this we have two for turtle and four for snake, our read should be classified as a snake. So, we know it's a snake because our cameras provide the most evidence for a snake. So, that's our simple read classification idea with Kraken 2 how it would classify your read. Now, there's some also other important thoughts on this. Uh, so for metagenomic data sets, this would happen through for all your reads, your hundreds of millions of reads, and you get a large amount of outputs. Uh, but before that, we have to talk about database design. So databases depends, or the classification sensitivity and specificity of your database is highly dependent on a couple of things. Uh, this includes database completeness. So Missing or partial sequences can introduce bias or reduce performance. If you are missing something from your database, you can't classify that, like a read to that organism. Uh, so that makes it harder if you don't have a good amount of diversity in your database to do metagenomic classification. You might miss a lot of things and assign them to higher taxonomic ranks than you want to just because of not having a sequence in the database representative of your organism. Um, the other thing, another thing would be database accuracy. So if you have a misannotated or contaminated genome, that can lead to incorrect taxonomic labels in your database and incorrect assignment when you're running your program. So a good example, I think we briefly touched on as well earlier, was how the NCBI nucleotide database is not always the best annotated. So if you're using data from there, you might have it classified as something it's not, which could mess up your database and your classification decisions or crack and press classification decisions due to that misannotation. And then finally, your camera length. So databases can be constructed based on different camera lengths. We use the former in our example. Um, don't remember the default length. I think it's, I'm not going to even guess, probably it's a lot higher than that. Uh, but when we're looking at our camera length, the longer your camera is, the more precise your hits are at the cost of your sensitivity. So if you have a really long camera, you're going to be very confident if it hits something because it's very specific. But if there's been mutations or evolution in that area, you'll miss it and will classify that part as the organism of interest. So there's some touch and go with how long you want your cameras to be. So I've also put in this little bit on the side here about frogs. So if we looked at our previous database with our turtle, our owl, and our snake, where do you think a frog would be classified if that was where our read came from? And the answer could be, it depends. If there's genomic cameras in the frog that match genomic cameras that are in our database, it would likely be classified at the highest level as vertebrates. Uh, but if there's no genomic cameras that match that, then it could be just unclassified. You have a read where you're not quite sure where it came from, which is not necessarily an issue, but that's just how your database would work. So a good example, I guess, of a database that's very specific to something 
would be a database you could use to remove human rates from SARS-CoV-2 sequences, which we've done a fair bit. Uh, so we only have those two things in your database. And if something's unclassified, that's that is not SARS-CoV-2 or human. So that's your example for how database design could work. So now what is our output? I alluded to get a lot of sequence data from metagenomic sequencing lots of times. Uh, so now what does the output look like? You get one line per read, um, and this is the data that crack into outputs. Uh, it also outputs a report that we'll look at in our module right after this. Uh, but this is just the generic output from Kraken 2. So it's tab limited. You have one, two, three, four, five, five columns. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is what you should have missed. So the first column, you either get a C or a U based on if the read was classified or unclassified. Your second column is the read name. So the read name from your, your past two files. Uh, the third column would be the taxonomic ID that the read was associated with. So for our first one, it was unclassified and associated with zero because zero is unclassified. For our second one, it was classified as a C. Or sorry, it's classified as 9606. So the NCDI um, taxonomic ID is 9606. And I don't know if people can figure out which one that is, but potentially. Uh, our third one here was identified as this 2,697,049 taxonomic ID. So that's, again, just what they're assigned to. Uh, the fourth column is the length. So this is Illumina data. You can see because it's got two read lengths. So each read was 151 bases long for all of our samples or all of our reads here. And then finally, the column that kind of tells you how Kraken 2 classified your read is this last one. So it's the LCA of each camera of the sequence. So how this works is, as I said, it looks through each camera in each read uh, and it goes along. So for our first one here that got classified, you see it hits the first 103 camers hit to our ID of 9606. And then the next six camers hit our ID of one, which is just roots. So it's something, but we don't know anything about it really. Uh, our next one camera hits 9606 again, and it does that all the way through the read. So the second, second classified one here, same thing, 59, first nine camers hit to this one, this ID, the next two hit to an unclassified sequence, and then so on. So that's how Kraken 2 kind of does data. You get this file. Uh, it's unwieldy to look at for a person, but you can use it in different programs to visualize your data, which is our last step of our talk here. So how do we organize, visualize, and interpret our output from Kraken 2 or other metagenomic, or not metagenomic, other read classification tools? So one example would be Krona, which is a program for visualizing the relative abundance of taxon in your web browser. And a good place you could find these is in NCBI's uh, SRA under the analysis tab. So you'd see something like this, where it tells you the number of reads identified, uh, what was unidentified, and then you get a Krona plot you can play around with. These are interactive pie charts that are hier hierarchical. So if I click on bacteria, it would zoom into bacteria and you can see all of the taxonomic ranks associated. And you can click all the way down if you want to. So these are very fun to play with. They're very useful in seeing what's in your sample by lenses. Another one that we're going to use in the lab is Pavian. So Pavian is a bit newer. Um, you can use it to support comparison of taxa from multiple data sets at once. Um, yeah, it creates sanity plots like this, and you'll get to use those in the lab to try and play around with identification. So I kind of want to bring it back again to how do we know which taxa are the cause of a disease. So again, our main goal of this lecture is or novel or emerging pathogen detection and identification. Uh, we looked at Kraken 2 as an example of how you identify or associate reads to different taxon or taxonomic ranks. So if you would do this, all the way through, you might end up with something like this. So a Sankey chart from KBM. And then from there, you want to narrow down your potential causes based on symptoms uh, or based on other knowledge that you know. So like a list of common human pathogens 
for common, uh, what do you call them? Common human houses, we'll just say. Uh, so that'd be kind of one of the ways you would determine if there was a disease that you weren't sure of in your, your patient sample. So we're gonna do a lab right away on this. Uh, I just wanna highlight another recent paper that was published that had the protocol on merging or on infectious disease identification. And it follows basically the same steps or most of the same steps we're doing in our, our lab. Uh, there's some differences, but there's a lot of the same ones. So I recommend you check this one out. Uh, for this paper, they're doing very similar steps. They're going to map their reads to bow types who do post removal, which we will use. Uh, well, like, we're using cats to post removal instead. Uh, and then without the reads, they're running Kraken 2 to classify their reads to a taxonomic rank, visualizing that, and then using a Z score to determine what is potentially a pathogen in the sample. So again, something very cool. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on it, um, but that would be an example to look at if you wanna do metagenomic pathogen, pathogen identification. And that is our final slide for the talk. Uh, I think we just go right into the lab. So I don't know if we wanna take a five minute break and then go from there.